you know, we, we all probably have family stories about the way they were treated or, you know, the sort of things they had to do to survive. Um, and so the thing I kind of always think about with that is, you know, with, with this sort of game space, it's about stepping up and, and starting to tell it like it is and, and start to sort of, um, you know, do it for those who, who couldn't. Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Zero to Play podcast. I'm your host, Carla Duke, and today I'm joined by Naftali Faulkner. Tali is the creator of Umarangi Generation, a multi-award winning artful cyberpunk-esque first-person photography game about a Maori courier driver for the Tauranga Express during an impending crisis. Today, we're going to talk about what it takes to commit to an artistic vision in your game, how Tali's indigenous background has pulled him through his journey and kept him moving forward, and advice for those wanting to help play a part in the maturing games industry. So sit back, relax, and enjoy episode five of season three of the Zero to Play podcast. Welcome to the show, Tally. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, no worries. Um, Gilda, everyone. Um, you can probably hear twang in my voice. I've lived in Australia for like, you know, best part of my life, I guess. Um, and I guess that's like kind of reflected in the game as well, because like for me, it was, um, you know, also an exercise in sort of um, connecting back up and, you know, like sort of, uh, you know, lighting up that wire and like uh, sort of for me, like, putting I guess into words a lot of ideas that I'd sort of thought about around this stuff um so yeah I get I'm um, thanks thanks for having me here um it's all good it's it's GDC it's GDC week so uh it's an early start for both of us but um totally yeah I I'm, appreciate I'm happy you to be here time no nah, it's good um I actually uh one thing that I I learned um and just really appreciated in the research that I was doing with you was the acknowledgement of countries uh like um sayings that you that you did and I wondered if you wanted to do that on this podcast and I actually did some research for um just some of the hair like the heritage around like what kind of things I could say for the zero to play podcast um is there anything that you'd want to say as an acknowledgement of country for this conversation uh, yeah, I guess I can, uh, like I'd, I'd say, I acknowledge and pay respects to Bunjalung people, which is where I live. I mean, I've got no problem saying that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I think acknowledgements, um, like, so I, I, I like, you know, I worked in a university and it was this really interesting thing to see that like acknowledgements, some people took them more as like a, um, you know, kind of thing that you'd put on every email signature and it was just a copied and pasted thing, which mm -hmm. I don't think is the right way to do it. Like, I think it's more about you yourself sort of, um, you know, acknowledging that you're on occupied ground and, you know, like just, just acknowledging that as I think is a huge, huge part of it. Like, uh, you know, and, th and there's ways, like, I think that, you know, we, we would sort of talk around that uh, when we were talking about more, I guess, like indigenous knowledge things. Cause I think it's the whole thing around, like, you want to sort of acknowledge where, um, you know, the, like if you're sort of doing design work and you're sort of doing it from an indigenous knowledge perspective, you sort of also want to acknowledge like the country that that uh, knowledge has sort of come from. And that might sound like a little bit spiritual or, mm -hmm. you know, hoogee bougie or, or whatever. But I think it's this uh, more, um, you, you know, it's like a deeper understanding of like, uh, you know, as, as indigenous people, it's like uh, there's this, I guess, understanding that um, knowledge doesn't exist between your ears. Mm -hmm. It's like you're, you're, um, understanding of the world is just sort of like, um, you know, it's like a sponge. It's it's coming in, and and you sort of need to, uh, I guess, pay respect to where you got those ideas from. Yeah. Um, and, and so, like, I think it's it's one of these things where, um, you know, like, I, I think that all comes into that discussion. But I, I think it's this whole thing where, you know, and, and this is I think what sort of sometimes is sort of the principal difference between sort of the discussion around you know if you're saying indigenous versus like maori or you know aboriginal or um you know native american it's all tied to place so like mm -hmm. um you know like and even if i'm saying you know maori it's like you know uh 
you know, Naitarangi, which is where I'm from, it's very different to somewhere like, you know, Naitahu or, um, you know, any like, like Napui or something like that, you know, it's, it's very much tied to where you're from. And I think, um, that that's just how I see the kind of thing with acknowledgement. Um, personally, yeah. yeah. If there's anything I'd, I'd say just for the, this conversation, um, and I'm going to butcher this, but, um, I really liked this and I like, I, so I, I grew up in New Zealand since I was three in, in Auckland and, um, I was born in the UK and I do feel like I, I want to do my part to just, um, bring attention to the, you know, the, the people who who came before and and a lot of the things in the research that i did for you really made me feel like that's a part that i i should look deeper into um the thing that i wrote down was um at zero to play we recognize the unique role of maori as tangata whenua and embraces the tatiriti o waitangi recognizing maori as tino rangiti ratanga of aotearoa while embracing the three guiding principles of the treaty partnership participation and protection i thought that was really cool um, and I haven't said that on the podcast before, and I just felt like it was the right moment to, um, to do that. And I just feel like your, your perspective on the whole conversation, I think is, is really powerful. Um, so going into like one, one really interesting question that I had about, um, uh, Umarangi generation and just kind of your, your view of games and art forms in general, uh, this one question I had that I, I'd love your perspective on is, if you were to make a game that would cause people to make one change in their behavior in real life, what would it be and why? If I was to make a game that would um, change their behavior, I guess um, the biggest thing that I, I, I sort of want to try to do with games in the future is sort of um, <clears throat> challenge people's ontological basis, if that makes sense. So ontology is that idea of like, how do you perceive reality? You know, like if you have an ontology where you think the sky is going to fall mm -hmm. you know when you walk outside you're going to do everything very differently you know you're going to live your life a very different way um and so you know for a lot of people they are pretty ingrained in a western ontology and that's not you know their fault it's it's what they grew up in so how they see the um state of the world is one where they perceive that certain things are okay to do and certain things are not right mm -hmm. i think um one of the things like indigenous knowledge is really good at is it's good at like one of the things you, you, you kind of, if you ever sort of start to engage with that stuff is that it's, um, you know, this kind of idea that like you begin to understand that, you know, your ontology is just an ontology. It's not the single ontology or the prime ontology. It is just one way of looking at things. And I think, um, you know, indigenous ontologies are very different um, and, you know, it's not, possible to really um take that off you know it is it is possible to, to i think reframe how you see things but you know once it's there it's 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 like your skin you can't really get rid of it yeah. um and so like i think with games um you know i hope with people who played umarangi generation it was the whole thing where they could start to see that you know actually there's a little bit more going on in the world um and you know there's the bait and switch trick of getting people to think it's one thing and then they play the game and it's one thing else right so they they sort of can see that but i think um you know games in the future uh that we've got planned is this idea of you know looking at you know what's the sort of you know base assumptions that are built into things and what can you sort of like how can you play with those in a game like how do you sort of look at those assumptions that are being made and you can sort of start to like use people's already existing knowledge around like, um, you know, what they assume to be correct. And how do you sort of play with that? How do you like use their sort of encyclopedic knowledge of everything that they've seen before um, and then, and then pull it into that. So like, you know, an example could be, um, <clears throat> you know, if you've ever watched a science fiction show, with a captain on a ship, you'll have a pretty good idea of the sort of person that would be. And so how do you sort of play with that, um, you know, perception of what you think a good captain is? How do you sort of use that to sort of make a point about maybe, um, you know, chain of command or, or like how does the mm -hmm. state sort of assign people? And I think like there's, there's ways to do that in games. And like, I think for me, um, you know, I'm not like an idiot where it's sort of the idea that I think like anyone could consume that. I think you've got to like, um, you know really smoothly stick the landing on it like you've got to really ease people in where they can sort of um start with a sort of 
uh, introductory point and then and then and then move it on on mm -hmm. so I, I, I like I think it's it's going to be a challenge but it's one of the challenges that I think like me and um, some of the writing team that I've sort of put together are like willing to rise to um, yeah that's crazy I, I I do just really admire how much thought you've put into just games as a medium as as a a, a medium to tell your stories and that's something that I mean I, I just feel like the the conversation where we're having like where we're sitting uh, you, you're you're making me feel like games are a lot more matured than what a lot of conversations that i engage with on a daily basis when it comes to games um and and i just i love that so much because games are obviously a young medium uh but i i can't wait for them to to, to kind of grow up a bit and to start talking about deeper issues and addressing um, just deeper, deeper stories that you see in films and books and things like that. Um, what is what is your kind of uh, hope for the kind of games that uh, are being created in the world right now? Um, oh, look, I, I would say like two things around that. One is to sort of, um, you know, what you're saying there is absolutely true, and I think there is a market for it now. Like, you mm -hmm. know, Omarangi generation. I think part of its success was that people did take it seriously as the art it was. And they were able to engage with the political narrative, you know, above sort of the the surface level stuff, and they're able to sort of latch onto that and and talk about it. And I think that um, that's the thing is that like I think that games are ready for this sort of more um, mature story storytelling. I guess where where you kind of in this space of um, you know you don't need this sort of entry level you know civics and citizenship class or HSIE kind of thing. You can move more into sort of like 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 one of the things i was sort of thinking uh is, is sort of like some games sort of have this sort of thing where they'll say capitalism is bad mm -hmm. and that's their conclusion mm -hmm. uh that should be the starting point mm -hmm. and then you should start to move from there you know what i mean mm -hmm. like you're, you're you're sort of start um, with the assumptions and then change that yeah well you start with those assumptions and you build on them um over the course of the like you know if you're going to say uh for example like umurangi generation has a very like i think strong idea about like um you know totally avoidable um neoliberal crises and and the the kaiju in the game is a very um direct parallel to things like climate change mm -hmm. the idea around that is that that's the starting point and then it's about looking at now what does everything around that look like with sort of like you know what does marketing look like in the future what is um politicians doing you know what a um sort of what does youth culture look like when they all know that they're fucked, right? Like they all know that they're, they're not going to make it out mm -hmm. of this one. Uh, and I think that there's this sort of thing where like you can do that with games and, you know, one of the brilliant things about this medium uh, as opposed to, you know, film is it's not a passive medium. You actually mm -hmm. get to sort of um, make people experience the feelings and, um, you know, actions of doing. And so like, um, you, you know, like the things I kind of think of is like, you know, you, you, you can get people to sort of go through a space uh, how, how you want them to sort of feel. And, and like, I think it, it's just one of these things where like, I do think that there are, you know, obviously some infantile discussions when it comes to games, but I, like, I, that's not necessarily a bad thing of the medium. I think it's like, you know, with film or, you know, the medium of moving pictures on a thing, obviously you have Pixar movies and you mm -hmm. have sort of stuff for kids, um, but you know, like, the, the sort of reference point I always think of is like games could be going to more of this space where in the seventies you had these, um, you know, directors coming out and they started to treat it more as an artistic medium rather than mm -hmm. a, you know, um, industry that was sort of like, you know, the Hollywood industry at the, in the sixties and fifties where it was about, you know, like uh, actors being, you know, owned by studios mm -hmm. and, and they're making movies that are basically, um, you know, these, these consumable, Mm -hmm. um bits of, bits of well well yeah like uh you know i, I can think of um you know like Marlon certain Brando. well well c certain movies where it was just sort of like the um to get you know bums on seats in a movie yeah. theater you know yeah. um and it's that kind of thing where um you know i'm not saying i'm some maverick leading the industry for it. i've only been yeah. here for two years but space for i everyone. think it's this yeah, yeah I, I think it's this um you know, I think indies have this huge opportunity where they're not tied to publishers tapping them on the shoulder to make decisions. They're they're in this space where they can basically do whatever they want. And you know, if you look at say like, 
you know, Nigel Lowry from Devolver Digital, he sort of talked about that idea of you don't even need a publisher at this point. If you can, you know, get a good Twitter campaign going or whatever, you take home the lion's mm-hmm. share of your entire profit. You don't need a publisher taking, you know, scooping it off the top or telling you what to do. So, um, you know, I, I think it's just one of these things where, um, you know, I'm excited for the future. And I think like, uh, I'm excited to see if, you know, like maybe Umarangi generation has sort of inspired any other game developers to sort of take it a bit more seriously or, you know, not be afraid to make a point. Because I think the reality is if you make a point and you're honest and earnest about it, people will get it. Like they'll they'll understand what you mean. It's And it goes both ways with that. If you're trying to make a point or make a product and your heart's not in it and you're sort of more in that, like, um, you know, you're trying to cash in on say like, putting you know like identity politics in your game because you've seen this kind of rating with this kind of audience Mm -hmm. or something the people who would try and consume that will see right through that as well they'll Mm -hmm. see that you're being dishonest if you're going to do that kind of stuff that is you know it's pure ontology at that point because like you know you can't really see things outside of your own perception of reality and if you're trying to do something that's not your uh Mm -hmm. perception of reality i guess is like it's very hard to um, you know, it's very hard to do that. And I think it's the kind of thing where people who do understand that will see through it. And like, you know, an example could just be, uh, you know, I have a mate, Tim, and he's sort of talked about this idea of like decolonizing games, right? And, you know, it's this whole thing where you see sometimes that um, non-Indigenous developers try to make Indigenous stories and they mm. always fall flat on their face for Indigenous people because we can see mm. right through this sort of... Um, more cynical Pandering. side of it so yeah yeah um so one thing well, about... more like a, you can see where the oh sorry yeah um yeah, it's fine we, we, we got that one done <laughs> <laughs> well uh, there's there's so many really big topics that i that i want to cover but one thing that i i like one i i do just really appreciate the amount of thought and time that you put into developing umarangi to tell this this really fascinating story and like that whole bait and switch but but what one thing that I did really find fascinating is that the game's actually fun and the whole mechanic of photography yeah. um, being the thing that you know pulls the player through and then like having those challenges through the art of photography I find that really fascinating and I was really impressed by how me as someone who used to be a photographer how much I really enjoyed that process um, like and I don't think this game could have really worked without something like photography to pull the player through so it was photography the 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 initial game mechanic all along did that come first before the story or was the story what you had initially and then photography kind of fell in this gap of being the perfect mechanic to help you tell that story no so photography was the first part um you know the story came later and Mm. i think it's one of those things where you know the story came later because it was the whole thing where you kind of had to say you know well if you're sticking one foot in the pool of this stuff you may as well just you know do a bomb and just jump all in you know what i mean but um like like the the idea of the photography side of it was you know um like i was teaching my you know younger cousin how to like operate a camera and thought that's pretty fun like that might make for a good game Hmm. at some point but you know basically the um the the thing i kind of think about is that you know the reason photography is a fun thing to do in the game is because like creativity is fun Mm -hmm. and i think it's this whole thing where a lot of people think they're not creative because you know they got yelled at at school for not for you know drawing in their books or something like that and they think oh well i'm not creative then but you know i think there's different forms of creativity and like photography is just one of them um you know one of the really positive things is that you see a lot of these players who come out the other end are you know wanting to pick up a camera at the end of the day and that's good um you know i think um it's just one of those things where like you know i was pretty I think it was a pretty safe bet to know that it was going to be a kind of uh, creative, fun thing to do for, for people because, you know, the most popular game at the moment is Minecraft, right? And that's a game all about being creative. You know, no mm-hmm. one plays that to slay the Ender Dragon. They play it to, you know, build mud shacks and stuff. Um, and I just think it's one of these things where, um, you know, that is, I guess, the secret source. But the, the other side of that, I think, is that, um, you know, I, I sort of, talk a little bit about that idea of respectful design which was like a sort of design principle taught to me um and you know i i think about kind of this whole thing that um when you give players the tools to do something and you just say here you go like 
do what you got to do um and, and and give them that agency to be creative it's just one of those things where um you know it's a it's a like it's a transaction i guess where you know i'm saying to them you can take whatever you want and i'm not going to like you know whack you over the head and say this is bad or whatever but i think it sort of goes two ways because like um you know recently we put in this um uh, creative mode in the game where you can sort of you know clip through walls and break the game mm -hmm. um and obviously you'd think like oh that's that's why would you put that in you, you're showing all the seams of your sloppy work but no it's this kind of thing where um you know now players have that full creative agency they're able to just do stuff that is you know purely flexing that muscle of mm -hmm. them um you know saying well i'm going to take a photo that looks good with these newer tools and it's going to reflect on me not the game you know what i mean yeah, um it's it's breaking the fourth wall in, in games in a way it's literally breaking the walls they just yeah. go straight in <laughs> I, I, I really appreciate that because it's it's a very meta approach um having an art form within the art form of games and and it's I almost feel like games are a, a very meta medium you know you have a, a combination of different um art forms whether it's music or um or art or um you know like programming as an art form like it's a combination of all these different things um and then having the game main game mechanic being a form of creativity as well um i find that I've, i just found that whole experience so fascinating and it just made my mind wander as to like like there, there must be only a handful of different creative ex, like creative game mechanics that you can put into a game um uh, and it just it just started making me think about what you know what is possible now with games because of how how nice it was to have photography within a game and and kind of talks about this whole tutorialization of of every aspect of of the world from like photography to other disciplines and other art forms and to teach them in a game first and and that's the kind of future i'm i'm seeing us slowly go towards with with games like umarangi um yeah well, is there anything you wanted to add on that that kind of little uh yeah i would say like you know one of the things about teaching ideas or you know concepts and games is mm -hmm. like you know i think you can do this with other things like you don't necessarily have to just do it with photography like um you know one of the things that i've sort of been talking with a couple of people about is this idea for you know essentially it's going to be game number three because game number two is about building the technology to make game number three but like mm -hmm. uh the, the idea of that is like you know one of the ideas that we want to sort of do there is sort of start to talk more about you know Maori concepts and stuff like that that are um oftentimes not portrayed correctly and i think there's this idea that you know if players are investing you know a couple of hours of playing a game it's this kind of thing where you can take them on a um you know learning journey i guess where they can sort of learn that concept correctly from the start because i guess the reality is that um you know a lot of times the stuff is taught incorrectly and then it leads to you know the sort of um you know arguing with an idiot moments where where you you know you see people who are um usually not maori or not indigenous talking about indigenous or maori issues mm. um and they're talking about them completely from these imaginary straw man positions that are completely fabricated and so it's this whole thing where um you know i, I think it's that whole um kind of thing where you know you can teach someone a concept as well in a game but you can start them off on the right way and then you can like build them more into uh, you know you can you can get them to understand it correctly because like I, I guess one of the things i think about is the biggest disservice a lot of people have had in their life is that like they went through school thinking that what they learned in school was correct mm -hmm. um and that's you know that's not to say that like mathematics is you know um you know not mathematics but more like history a lot of times in you know western nation states is always taught um you know by the oppressor i guess is the word to say it mm -hmm. but you know for example in australia here because that's the school system i went through um is you know and i'd assume it's probably similar um for students back mm -hmm. home but you know it's this whole thing of um in australia's school system the entire curriculum had removed every form of atrocity committed by the Australian nation state. Mm. And, you know, it had sort of uh, tried to construct this narrative that, um, you know, the government accidentally 
committed these atrocities to Aboriginal people, you know, that it accidentally invaded and slaughtered and, you know, it just accidentally, uh, you know, an officer accidentally, he accidentally signed the policy that, um, you know, uh, made people, you know, half citizens and things like mm. that. And it's this, um, you know, really sick thing uh, when you start to look at it. But I think it's this kind of thing where, you know, some of the ideas that we want to put in games in the future, they do very much lie in spaces like that. But the mm -hmm. idea is to sort of go back to square one, mm -hmm. but rather than, you know, sort of, uh, if, you, if you'll just sort of imagine this in your head is rather than starting down a crossroads and walking forward mm -hmm. you go to the right or you go to the left you know you take a completely different route to get to your destination so like the idea of that is to sort of start by getting people to walk a path that actually explains the concept well to them and then shows them now this is like now that you understand it here's how it is you know in in you know the world i guess so yeah, it, it, like That's I think really it's exciting. Yeah. yeah, like like, and, and I think it's possible to do in games because games, at the end of the day, have a three act structure or whatever. You know, like you can place that out in levels, or mm -hmm. you can put that in dialogue, or you can like the best thing I think is you can put it into gameplay, which is the kind of thing where you can start to get people to question what they're doing, you know, or they can start to, um, you know, s see that sort of like what's happening in the space is is the the, the point, you know. Mm -hmm that's what i love about uh games being an active medium is is like when you make them have that realization or have to like make that decision i feel yeah. like that's so much more powerful than a passive medium like watching a movie where you're kind of you're feeling those emotions but when you actually have the control and you actually say have to step forward or shoot that guy or um you know leave that person behind it's i feel like it's such a bigger emotional toll because you're actually you know living inside that person's person's head do you do you feel that same way as well like that there's there's so much potential for really powerful moments to, well, to give the player I, I would say one of my favorite games that did that uh sort of recently was sort of um well i wouldn't say recently it was probably more than five years ago now but there was a game that came out called lisa the painful and it's a um game made an rpg maker mm -hmm. uh you know it's a bit rough around the edges but that's all right like my game's rough around the edges too i think it's you know it's fine um but it's this game by uh, austin jorgensen he made this game where it has a lot of really tough decisions that are decisions that actually make you have to sort of consider things and you know not to spoil anything but but you know there's like a um part in the game where you know one of the earliest decisions is you get a new party member for your you know rpg party and he's there and he's useless right he does he has zero damage when you attack people and all he can really do is like heal right and basically um you come across some bandits really early on and they say uh hey here's the thing we'll either take all your supplies and money or you can give us terry hints and he's like you know you have this decision really early on oh do i want terry or do i want this right um and then there's like a later um decision you have to make where um you know this other character says i'm going to cut this person's nipple off who's just like a you know person that you kind of care about and young right it's, it's a child yeah. um he says i'll either do that or i'll cut your arm off i think that was the mm -hmm. thing and in the game if brad the main character who's a martial artist loses his arms it like Dub, it like halves his damage output and stuff yeah, like that yeah. and so it's this really hard decision where players are choosing do i want to opt into mm -hmm. difficulty for the rest of the game mm -hmm. or do I, I want to um you know like do the right thing and it's this really interesting thing because uh you know one of the things that's an experience with that character is if you try to talk your way out of it and like say why are you doing this you know you don't mm -hmm. need to do this he'll just do both and it's mm -hmm. like uh the kind of thing where um you know you don't get an easy answer to stuff mm. like that and so like i think um y you know that that kind of stuff in games is f for me is is like a very um like like i think it's one of these things w where you can really start to get players to sort of uh think a lot more about these these decisions if like they're starting to um do and and there's a like i guess what's the word uh there's like an 
action consequence, I guess. Like, yeah. like in terms of your skill set is either like limited or expanded based on your decisions. So yeah, like- I think it's it's really important to tie that into the gameplay. So you 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 know you make a decision that affects the the the, the damage of the player. Because I think I, I think when you make choices like that in games or like a narrative driven game, it, it it doesn't have as much weight if it doesn't directly affect the like if it just affects the story. I think that that's that's one you know that's one option which is definitely doable but when it actually affects the gameplay you i feel like you're a lot more connected to that decision um mm. yeah. well because like i think one of the things um that i that i kind of think about is like a lot of times i think the way that's handled in games as well can be a little bit it's a little bit worn in at the moment where like sometimes people think the only way a meaningful decision happens is that a character dies mm-hmm. you know and it's usually not your character um and i think there's you know punishment's worse than death you know where it's more the idea that um you know you can get players to sort of you know get a slap on the wrist where maybe it's the kind of thing where they're not allowed to use certain items anymore suffer yeah yeah like and i think that's (laughs) that that's more long lasting than just having you know a certain you know pre-scripted character not Mm -hmm. show up anymore Mm -hmm. um you know like like one of the examples i would think of is like or or, you know to, to give like a hypothetical here would be like you know let's say um if there was a moment in that new God of War game where um, based on a decision, you weren't allowed to use the ax anymore and you had to fisticuff your way through the, you know, Mm -hmm. the next 40% of the game or something like that, because Mm -hmm. that was an active decision you wanted to make kind of thing. And, you know, I think that would change the dynamic of that game because, you know, the fisticuffs is a very different Mm -hmm. play style to using the ax. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? It could be this sort of thing where it really um, solidifies like what's, at stake there or you know like what the decision actually meant to to doing that thing Mm. um and so yeah i think i think about that stuff a lot when it comes to games because i think it's one of those things that the medium can do really well with like just putting you in the position of someone or putting you in Mm. someone's shoes with that in today's supporter segment i'd like to point you towards gameuidatabase.com this is the perfect resource for anyone interested in seeing the ui and design of some of the most popular games and interesting indie titles out there It has an incredible tagging system and navigating the pages and games couldn't be easier. So if you're researching games for your own project or you're just curious about how some of today's studios are being creative and unique with their work, check out gameuidatabase.com. Back to the show. Yeah, it's definitely not. um, I can see why that kind of um, angle isn't favored with like publishers and big studios because it's, you know, as soon as you cut off uh, the main game mechanic and give them a different one, it's, it's an extra you know the, the the amount of work involved is a lot more but i think once we yeah. see more games really take those risks and make those decisions clear then I, I think the the market will prefer that because the experience will be that much more um just all encompassing um uh yeah uh, one question i want to ask you before um uh, what, that i wanted to ask you in this conversation was do you do you have like an earliest memory of of yourself growing up where you wanted to express yourself or be creative um i just want to kind of understand a bit more your your background and and how you how you got into choosing games as a, as a medium to tell your stories yeah so i guess um you know uh we, we got a playstation when we were pretty young and uh, this is between a family of seven so you know lots of gran turismo and soccer um but you know I think the first game I ever got was Crash Bandicoot when I was like, you know, it was like on sale for 10 bucks at Kmart or something. And it was my birthday, so I got it. But um, basically, uh, you know, the I think the big thing for me was that when I was sort of um, in my early teens, my mum moved out to a, um, you know, like a just a paddock, right? That was... Um, like really isolated and remote and there was like no power no running water so you know obviously no internet um and so you know we spent probably a good part of 18 months out there where Hmm. you know you you would sort of see weird things all the time um and you know you would sort of be in this basically like little house on the prairie shack um where you know basically you were sort of uh, (laughs) pretty bored most of the time so like Mm -hmm. for me it was sort of like about you know, I came up with a lot of fictional uh, ideas for games and a lot of them were, you know, honestly, they're probably just like, you know, knock off Ratchet and Clank or whatever. But um, <laughs> ba- basically like the the sort of big thing 
about that was I was sort of like, you know, thinking a lot about, you know, wanting to make games. Um, and then I think it was like the whole thing is that, you know, as I sort of started to, you know, grow up and we moved back into town and got electricity again, um, I think there was that big turning point for me where like I played some of Hideo Kojima's games and, you know, the way he sort of did it was there was this like, everything that was on screen was very serious but then someone would say like press the select button uh so there was like this thing where he was like incorporating the uh you know the unique element of games into the you know mm -hmm. the the story he was telling you know where you couldn't really do that uh with you know like a film like it's not like with a film you could sort of midway through the film say go to the concession stand and look for the popcorn mm. box you know what i mean it's it's more like um interactive well it's it's more like you know you 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 have these moments that you know he's he's basically fucking with you the player like he, <laughs> he you know like i'm thinking of moments where like you know you had to plug your controller in the second controller port and mm -hmm. you know like I, the, the, the big thing i think about that is that you know then going back another 10 years later and revisiting those games when i was like you know 23 25 you see that um He's not just taking the medium seriously he's talking about concepts that are way above where the medium is at the moment you know like um it took what 20 years for people to or not 20 years but i'll say 15 years or 10 years for people to finally understand the concept of what he was talking about in metal gear solid 2 mm. you know where his the, the game is about you know this idea of memes and stuff like that and then when he followed that up with metal gear solid 5 He's talking about a, another thing there it's far beyond the discussion that games are ready to have and i think it's this whole thing where i want to keep probably doing what he's doing where it's that whole point of um introducing a like a layer of um what would you call it like academic content or you know more mm -hmm. um uh philosophical or deeper content or whatever yeah. um because i think it's important to have that because it's this kind of thing that where you know like you can really grow the medium through that. And like, I think, um, you know, the, the thing I sort of think about is like with those certain games, there's the, like, and, and, you know, you, you asked earlier about like Umarangi's just really fun to play. They're, those games are just really fun to play as well. And I think that's the sort of um, hook that gets people in mm -hmm. is that they're fun games to play and that they're, you know, enjoyable. And then the sort of, rest of it is is about introducing them to those concepts so like I, I would say yeah honestly i think that hideo kojima's works are a pretty big inspiration for me mm. um and I, and I would say probably that i think a lot of the um you know japanese game designers are as well because i think this is the big difference i can think of is that in japan versus you know uh, you know the west as a broad concept japan seems to be trying to cultivate uh directors or you know these people who sort of can take mm -hmm. the game element and pull it a little bit further mm -hmm. into where you know you're starting to um take that medium much more seriously mm -hmm. and so like you know i'm not saying that's that's impossible to do in um the west but i think it's that whole thing where you know the the games themselves can be these things where um you know the director is given this uh, or this agency to sort of do an artistic vision and the producers are not necessarily going to pull him back or stop him like i mm -hmm. i remember um reading about this idea that metal gear solid 4 which was hideo kojima's sort of at the time he said it's the last one he had a ending for the game written that was this idea of you know um the 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 idea was that the sort of story ends and snake and otacon are tried for war crimes and killed and you know, it was a really sad ending and they had to rewrite it um the big difference though was that the new ending that they had in there was this really interesting one where what happened was like uh these two voice actors who were father and son hadn't talked to each other in 10 years because they had a big falling out and secretly what Hideo Kojima did was like he got them in the same room to deliver these lines where no it was way. the equivalent of father and son where it was big boss and snake and big boss saying i'm sorry for putting you through all this 
and it was the kind of thing where those two act and this is only for the japanese version obviously yeah. but it was this sort of thing where that was this mediating thing and they were able to sort of deliver those lines because they weren't ever going to try and talk to each other again and you know it's, it's one of those things where i think like those are those are stories that are so positive about um you know uh that work and and i think like um you know i i think if there's anyone that you want to sort of base your your craft on i think it's got to be kojima in a lot of ways because there's that um that just understanding of the the industry you know or the the, the medium and i think mm -hmm. like um you know that that's that, that's something i kind of think about a lot it's, it's just that articulation of the medium and how to do that yeah i love it yeah it's someone that's pushing it forward i think w with games it's uh there's a whole element you know people people play games just for fun uh, that they don't need to have a um a kind of narrative that they're pushing which and like we were talking about earlier there's there's room for all of these games within the market and and i think you're you're focusing on this area about pushing and like maturing games making them be uh, able to tell stories in, in new and interesting ways um, and I, I definitely think, yeah, Hideo Kojima is a, a, a perfect inspiration um, and the kind of thing that I, I would like to see more of in the industry, um, you know, as well as everything else. Like, I think there's a, there's a space for Fortnite and Battle Royale and, um, you know, just Candy Crush, those kind of games that, uh, you know, are for just distracting entertainment, um, that kind of thing. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, I do find that really, really exciting um early on in your in your in your journey um or actually in a talk that you you um you did you mentioned how when you started your indie game journey um it feels like you're on your own but but you felt like you had your um ancestors behind you uh to tell the stories of the game and that made that made it not feel so alone and i i thought that, that was a really interesting comment that you made because uh indie game development can feel very alone at times and um, and I just wanted to um, mention that because I thought that, that was very powerful. Is there any other kind of thoughts or feelings that you had about starting off the kind of indie game journey and like anything that you want to say to others that might be going through a similar experience than that you did at the beginning of Umurangi? Um, Yeah, well, I guess, you know, for if Maori designers are out there listening, you know, one of the things I have to think about a lot is, you know, we've got to tell our own stories and it's, you know, like, the thing I kind of think about is like we kind of owe it to them fellows before us because um, you know we we all probably have family stories about the way they were treated or you know the sort of things they had to do to survive um, and so the thing I kind of always think about with that is you know with with this sort of game space it's about stepping up and and starting to tell it like it is and and start to sort of um you know do it for those who, who couldn't say anything or they had to sort of be um pushed down you know like uh, for, for me I don't, I don't i think this is obviously a audio podcast but for me I, I pass white real easy um and so it's that whole thing where you know i know the story from my family about you know certain tupuna who had to you know like cover up or put flour on their skin because mm -hmm. they'd be you know bashed or um that kind of thing and i also know the you know the violence that came from you know family separating over that stuff and and the kind of um you know social constructions that ripped our families apart so you know it's this whole thing where you know when i say that i don't say it lightly because it's the kind of thing where um you have to do it at the end of the day and it's it's a hard thing i would say generally for game designers um who you know aren't indigenous just broadly now um if you are in this industry take a look at your own history when it comes to um you know maybe your family came from really blue collar you know working class roots you know i know mine did um and it's the sort of thing where you know them to sort of see you if you know imagine they were still alive today or they're sort of looking down from heaven at you kind of thing um you know them to see you sort of working on this really new industry and pushing it or you know shaping it um is a really you know good thing to do it's a really smart or not mm -hmm. smart what's the word it's a very um powerful it's, it's, it's yeah it's it's a kind of thing where you know you're 
you're basically in this industry from its infancy. It's less than a hundred years old. The mm. rules haven't been set yet. And you're able to sort of go in there and start to um, put your own spin on it. And I think it's one of these things where, um, you know, we're basically in the sort of new age of technology and computers where they're starting to be, you know, shrunk down and put into, you know, a watch or something like that. Right. And I think it's this whole thing where what we make as decisions now as game developers is going to inform the industry for the next hundred years easily. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's not me sort of big noting myself. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about we as game developers as a whole, mm -hmm. the decisions we make on sort of what becomes the standard for that kind of making will be the sort of standard that people will look at and follow in your footsteps of. And, and that's not a crazy thing to think of because it's the same thing that happened with film. If you ever go and uh, watch interviews with sort of the older, uh, you know, with the filmmakers you think are all classics from the eighties and seventies, sorry to say, they will reference films from the fifties. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll reference films that they grew up watching. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the kind of thing where, you know, there's that hand me down, nature to this industry that that's that's there and so um you know i think it's this kind of thing where acknowledge that and know that when you go to make this stuff okay and mm -hmm. that might help you that might help you know push push you push you over the line into saying all right i'm just gonna get some runs on the board i'm gonna try and make something and then go from there um and and i think that's 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 a really strong thing yeah, that's really inspiring um, and really well said. Uh, and, and you're exactly right. I think referencing the film industry, I think games are, are growing extremely fast and the, the amount of people interested in games, I think, are expanding as well, um, using different platforms like mobile and uh, it's just, it's, it's growing in all directions. So there's, there's so many opportunities to inspire the next generation to, to think of new ways of telling stories, think of new ways of, of playing games. Um, and you're right, that's, that's really exciting. Um, I, um, I, I want to, uh, uh, I, I want to state that at the end of this week, you will find out if Umarangi Generation wins the grand prize award at the <laughs> IGF awards. Yeah. And I want to ask your thoughts on that. Like, how do you feel about that? I mean, you've, you've won several awards um, for Umarangi Generation in the past. And I think even, uh, a, f a few weeks ago, you you won the the grand prize at Free Play. Yeah. Um, so that's incredible. How has that all felt? And and how do you feel going into the next week to see if if you'll win another huge award? Yeah, I'm I'm blown away by it, honestly. Um, you know, like I got a message from uh, Taku, who's from Playism. They they sort of run our Japanese localization, and even then they, they there's a um, Japanese media festival award that's been sort of worked out. And he said, Oh, well, I'll go accept it for you, you know, unless you want to come to Japan. I said, Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, there's this whole thing where, um, you know, like I've been pretty blown away by the response. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying we're going to win because there are some really awesome games there at IGFs at the moment. Um, you know, we're pretty happy to just be nominated, really, because um, basically we're brand new at this stuff. And so, it's a really positive sign that people are saying we should probably keep doing what we're doing when it comes to, you know, these sort of um, games as, as art, I guess, and games as a thing that you, you sort of play, but there's also a deeper meaning behind them. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really happy with that. And, you know, I think the, the biggest thing for me is that, you know, it's been this crazy, you know, almost two years, I guess, but like it's been this crazy moment of, um, you know, sort of, uh, meeting all these new people in industry and sort of starting to see how it articulates and looking behind the cracks and things like that. Um, you know, I think one of my things I would sort of think of uh, just some last little bit of advice for any other game developers, because I'm sort of aware that, you know, it might seem a little bit like, yeah, it's easy for you to say you won an IGF or you got nominated mm -hmm. or whatever. Right. But I think one of the things I would say is that it's probably in your shoes, um, you know, less than two years ago. And I think the biggest thing about indie game development um, or, you know, game development as a whole is, you know, you got to sort of learn to walk before you can run. And um, I think the whole thing around that I sort of think about is that, you know, you don't have to make your magnum opus first. You can just start something small and, 
you know, if it is getting a little bit too tiring, the project you're working on, just shelve it. Um, you know, there's the saying, good designs are never um, finished. They're just abandoned, right? And so you can always, if you've got a project that's been burning away at you for seven years and you're um, basically at the point where you're too sort of afraid to work on it anymore because, you know, I've been there as well. You're kind of afraid you're going to break more things or you're going to stuff everything up. Um, you know, take six months off and make something else. Make something really small, like a little part of the game that you want to make, you know? Mm -hmm. um, for me, Umurangi was just about making the camera, right? It was about figuring out how does a camera work in 3D? Okay, mm -hmm. does it does this and this, right? Okay, make a photo photography game. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're, if you're doing something and you think like, I want to do this in my game, but I don't know how it will fit. Well, just, hey, fork it off and make something small with that. Just mm -hmm. release it. See and what people think. You might be inspired think. by it later with another. Well, thing. you might be inspired by it later, but you'll also now you have the technology to just put it in the thing you want to do. Like mm -hmm. as I said, this second game we're working on is about building the technology for the third one. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing around that is like making sure the AI works, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, you know, th that's a really big thing I think when it comes to games. And I think like if you're a first-time game developer, AI shouldn't even really be thinking about that because that's way too difficult mm -hmm. to to start with because. It's, a, it's an added layer of complexity on top of what you're already doing. And so having it more as this little experimental sandboxy thing, um, you know, could be the kind of thing where you, you can play around with it and you can not be too attached to the idea and you just get it done and ship it. And I think it's the kind of thing where you can really be proud of putting something out the door and, and having it done. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think like that, that's the thing I kind of think about a lot. Uh, because I've seen I've seen where the industry is at the moment, and I've seen you know how other indies are doing at the moment, and I think that's that's probably my biggest bit of advice. Um, and the reality of that is that's not even my advice; that's the advice that got given to me. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to pay it forward, and I'm happy to share that. Okay, totally. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, uh, we we're we're running low on time, but there's two quick questions I want to ask you. Um, and then I want to finish on a quote uh, that I read about Umarangi that I thought was awesome. Uh, so first question is, what do you think of game jams? Do you, like from your angle of your perspective of games, do you think game jams are a great uh, way to work on your craft? I think game jams are these really interesting things at the moment because some game jams are held just to promote YouTube content. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the ones you should probably avoid because you'll get sort of stung where basically the games coming out of the game jam are usually chosen based on if they would make good content for a YouTube channel rather than being, you know, the, the heart and soul of game jams, which was to just experiment and see what, mm -hmm. you know, throw undies at the wall, see what sticks. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the whole point of that was that, um, you know, I think it's good to do game jams or to sort of do a, you know, one week project with some friends and sort of see what, what goes on. Cause it's always good to experiment and sort of, try and do something that you're not too attached to. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think there's, uh, you know, like, like yeah, I, I, I would probably just summarize it as that because I think it's, it's this kind of thing where sometimes um, you want to be doing them for the right reasons. And so like an example I would probably give with that is like, you know, um, this is going way back, but I remember a friend of mine showing me, oh, hey, check out this game from the Cyberpunk Game Jam. I really enjoyed it. What did you think? Uh, it was this little indie title called um, Valhalla, right? Which was this uh, cyberpunk bartending game, right? And they said, oh, it's just a fun, chill little game, right? And it was the kind of thing where that game was sort of um, a small, simple idea that was doable by a small team. And they said, all right, well, let's turn it into a full game. And that's what I think those game jam games should be is mm. they should be this experimentation of is this a viable game to make? Mm or a viable little strategy. And if it is, well, there you go. That's your little project that you can work on and finish, right? Because it's yeah. enough of an idea that you know from that week of working on it that yeah. that's a feasible idea to do. And you've, you've basically got the, the core idea down mm -hmm. to go, yeah. It's a good, uh, good prototyping, um, you know, pressure thing to, to get something created over the course of a weekend to prove a, a, a concept. Um, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a good way to put it. Um, the other second question I had was um, Thor is the only other person that I see credited for the game. And he's the person who did the, um, the, com the composing and the music. Um, is that correct to see the only other person? And what was it like working with him and, and having another creative person 
on board with with your your kind of baby yeah so thor um you know i I contacted him actually quite a while ago because i did have you know a smaller little project i was working on that ballooned out of scale to be feasible but i talked to him about using some of his music because at that point he was sort of a youtuber who did some um, soundcloud stuff on the side and i sort of talked to him about can i use some of your music and then when this game started to come out, I said, oh, well, you know, they're probably not going to head with the other one, but can I use some of your music, right? And he said, yeah, sure. Um, and we sort of worked out a rate that worked for him and um, that was good. And so, you know, it was the sort of thing where when we sort of came with that, uh, you know, it became more of just, more than just the composing because we would talk about the game and I'd sort of show him how it's coming along. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the level I ideas was sort of inspired by uh you know he sort of had this conversation with me about Kowloon which is a um you know city in Hong Kong that was demolished um but you know it's sort of the template that a lot of cyberpunk games use and so Mm -hmm. the idea with that was that um you know that's what uh Cuddy Cuddy became because it was this whole um you know sort of thing where when I looked at that I was sort of reminded of sort of like how um oftentimes in cyberpunk media the people portrayed as you know the um detective whatever they live in the you know uh, the 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 darkest depths of society and i'm like well who these who lives in these darkest depths of society you know society actually right and Mm -hmm. i think the reality was it's like well that's actually where we would probably be so um you know just based on because the system's not going to change it's not like they're going to suddenly you know value the treaty or anything like that and so like it was about okay now let's take a different spin on that and do a different mm-hmm. thing and so um you know thor did that and then when it came time to the dlc you know he composed an entire new suite of music like it was mm-hmm. essential to making the game then wow. i think it's one of the things where um you know obviously i still got to sort of have main director input and create creative output and stuff like that but i think it is good to have people around you that you can sort of bounce off and mm-hmm. and and sort of throw ideas at the wall because i think it's like the whole thing where um you know it, it's, it's it's good to be like that and good to be all on the same page and you know we're probably going to work together on projects in the future because it's just the kind of thing where um you know there's there's enough of a shared connection there where we can sort of talk about it and mm-hmm. so like i think um you know it'll be good and you know he's happy to keep doing it and he's happy to keep making videos and sort of do this on the side. And that's good, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, for me, I was able to sort of like help him start to understand how to use Unity because he wants to get into making games. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's a really positive thing as well because I think he's on the map now as um, a really good composer and he's getting gigs around that. So, you know, it's it's just this kind of thing where um, sometimes getting people from outside the industry is better than, you know, just hiring the, mm-hmm. you know, the four people who people know as the person who does this so yeah you know that's how you get like a fresh perspective and uh yeah i think that's that's awesome i I, i'm really excited to to see what you can achieve when you work with a bigger team and and what your plans are for game number two and and game number three as well uh i think that that's really exciting and i'm I'm definitely going to be keeping a keen eye on your your game dev journey uh one thing i want to end on is this uh this quote that i i saw from the washington post that when they spoke about umarangi and I'm just going to read it and, uh, and end the podcast on this. So uh, they said, we can learn things about characters from play, but in a lot of cases, the repetitive nature of tasks in a game map poorly to human character. Plot often takes a back seat to the foremost aim of many games, which is not, which is not to be a vehicle for story, but largely, largely just to be fun to sit with. A bad plot can be endured, even sometimes enjoyed, but bad gameplay is a stone in your shoe deeply and immediately felt what really helps bridge this game story gap is is sorry uh bridge game story gap is when a game's environments do their share of lifting on the storytelling front here umarangi generation exceeds all expectations i thought that was that was really powerful especially coming from um a respected uh, source like the washington post and uh, and yeah, I just I really appreciate you giving me your time. I really loved what you spoke about ontology at the beginning, and uh, I, I agree with how everyone should have a very open mind and know that there's different ontologies. And um, I'm excited about how you take that into your future game projects and how you teach your players uh, different ontologies and um, uh, just kind of pro- make people 
mature and become better better people at the end of the day so uh, thank you for your time thank you for the games that you're that you've made and that you're making and i look forward to seeing how your journey progresses so thanks for coming on the show thanks for having me um and if anyone is interested in following um and following tyler you can find him on uh twitter at uh Veselikov. i didn't uh, actually find out the context of uh why you get referred to as vez sometimes uh it's v-e-s-e-l-e-k-o-v uh, what's the background on that? Uh, 14 year old original <laughs> character making a, yeah, basically it's just a legacy thing from basically that was my account name for ages. So I just awesome. went, stuck with it. Who cares? <laughs> all good, all good. Well, yeah, follow, <laughs> follow Tally on Twitter there. Um, all, or at, um, Umurangi game, um, on Twitter and definitely go pick it up on steam. You can also get it on switch. Um, yeah, thanks for your time and have a good rest of your day and enjoy the week of, of GDC Talks. All right, cheers. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the show. I hope you found it valuable and learned something new about game development and the future of games. If you did, I'd love to hear about it. Please message me on Twitter at zero to play and we can keep the conversation going there. If you want to hear the latest news of the show as soon as it's released, you can sign up to our newsletter or follow us on Twitter. For all of our episodes, you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting service. All links can be found in the description below. Take care and see you all next week for a brand new episode.